Hello everyone and welcome to CRAMSEARCH, clinical research appraisal and methodology for surgical trainees, where we pick a paper fresh from the press on a hot general surgical topic. We review it for you, we present it for you, we critique its methodology for you and provide top of the field expert opinion and teaching on research appraisal and methodology. My name is Gio Perin and together with Professor Sababala Subramanian and Maria Digby, we bring you Cram Search from the wonderful region of the Yorkshire and the Humber. So uh, we've been talking about um, evidence-based practice um, on, for, on a few occasions, and I think we, we were focusing on the first two steps in evidence-based practice, which is asking the right clinical questions, and the second is acquiring evidence, how we acquire evidence. And um, I've done a few talks on these. Uh, and I was thinking that we should just go back to this PICO uh, framework, uh, because we had a few issues when we were recently discussing a paper with some students in Leicester, when we were struggling to apply the PICO format uh, for the um, studies that they were critiquing. So I thought we should just go back to the PICO uh, framework explain what it is, um, why we need this framework, what the limitations are with the PICO framework and what are some of the variants. So it's just a few slides, so hopefully it shouldn't be too long. So to recap, I guess um, you guys uh, know and have heard of the PICO framework. So the P stands for population, which is the patient group that is a subject of the uh, question. Um, I is intervention that is being considered, C is comparator or control, and O is the um, outcome of interest, or at least one of the main outcomes of interest. So essentially, this framework is used to frame a clinical question, uh, or a re research question for that matter. So if you have a patient uh, that uh, has a specific problem and you're wondering about a particular intervention, um, so as to reduce the risk of a, uh, uh, an outcome you're interested in, um, then you think about uh, the question in the form of a PICO, right? So if you've got that PICO um, framework sorted, then you can use the PICO framework to then formulate a search strategy. So essentially, uh, you define the concepts based on the PICO, and then use the appropriate keywords, and we talked about this in one of our previous um, introduction to EBM talks. And you also use the PICO framework to uh, appraise a research paper, as you guys have just done. So these are the um, uh, these are essentially the uses of uh, uh, the PICO framework. So the paper that we've just discussed, um, where you compare laparoscopic sleeve gastrectomy versus a ruin Y gastric bypass in um, um, adult patients with significant obesity, looking at uh, specific outcomes. So let's try and work out what the PICO is. So the population is obviously adult patients with obesity. And as you have done, uh, we probably need a lot more detail to clearly explain you know, what this population is uh, to the listener. So uh, you will need detail on eligibility criteria. You need to say what you mean by adults, uh, what are the um, age cutoffs, you need to say how you define obesity, and you'd also need to say, you know, what kind of filters you uh, would apply uh, to an uh, obese adult patient who is being subjected to surgery. And then uh, intervention uh, here is a laparoscopic sleeve gastrectomy, and just stating what the intervention uh, is um, alone is usually not sufficient. Uh, we need a lot of detail on the methodology, and the reason we need um, the details on uh, um, the methods or how the intervention is actually implemented is to be able to assess um, you know, how uh, this can be applied in other settings. Similarly, for the control, and the control here is laparoscopic ruin y gastric bypass, you need details on how the bypass is actually done. And then the outcome um, in this study, uh, we've said, I've heard the outcome was percentage um, excess weight loss, so you need to think about what this is, how this is defined, as Alistair explained to us, um, and then that kind of definition and how you assess the weight loss uh, is really important so that other people can go and reproduce um, uh, this uh, kind of study. And also 
you can then, uh, if you have insight into how the outcome was assessed, then you can compare different studies that have assessed this particular outcome. Right, so what are the problems then? Um, what are the issues in using the PICO framework for clinical questions in general? Sometimes in some specific situations, you might want to place a lot of emphasis on certain other considerations, like for example, time. So in certain clinical questions, uh, it may be important to consider, uh, say, the duration of treatment. If it's an ongoing treatment for considerable lengths of time, then you might want to say that the treatment was employed for three years or five years or longer. In some other um, clinical questions, uh, what might be important is time to the outcome. Like, for example, in this particular study we've discussed, we were looking at expected weight loss over 10 years. So um, if you're able to present uh, right at the outset within the framework, time to outcome, then that might be um, quite useful. Another consideration that might be useful to add to the PICO is the type of study. So uh, in other words, study design. We talked about study design before. So it'll be useful to specify whether the study is a randomized controlled trial or a cohort study or a case control study. So what some of the EBM enthusiasts have suggested is that we add these T's to the PICO. So we've got a PICO TT, um, one T is for time, the other T is for type of study. So um, I think that's a, it's a good um, thing to do. Uh, so when you're describing a study, when you're summarizing a study, um, in addition to PICO, if you think about these additional considerations, then that's quite helpful. Now, PICO was initially described as a valuable sort of tool um, for studies or questions that apply to treatment. That was the initial intent. But as you know, clinical questions fall into many other categories. And, then the, and the question then was whether PICO applies equally well to the other categories. So looking at the other categories, one of the categories, prevention, prevention questions, you know, the, does abstinence from smoking reduce post-operative wound infection? That's a classic prevention question. Now, um, for prevention questions as well, PICO works um, quite well because the I in PICO, that stands for intervention, uh, we're not specifying whether the intervention um, is therapeutic or preventative. At the end of the day, it is an intervention that aims to change the natural history of a particular problem. And therefore for prevention questions, PICO works quite well. Next category of questions would be questions relating to risk, risk of a particular disease or prognosis and observational studies in general. Now, obviously in risk and prognosis studies, you do not have any intervention, but you have what we call exposure. So um, it can be quite straightforward in that you simply swap um, exposure instead of the intervention. And let's say you're looking at uh, smoking and bowel cancer, for example, you know, your smoking would be your exposure, people who don't smoke would be the controls and the occurrence of bowel cancer would be the outcome. Now, there are many studies, or you might have a question where you say, I would like to know the prognosis of stage four bowel cancer. And in, that's a very valid clinical question. And if you want to answer that, then obviously you cannot apply the PICO format because there's no ex, uh, exposure or, and comparator, but you just have the population and the outcome. And that, that's um, um, uh, quite uh, easy to do, relatively straightforward to do. What about other questions? Now, diagnostic questions are a problem. Let's take an example. So if, for example, you're interested in knowing what the diagnostic utility of CRP in appendicitis is, um, let's think about how you can apply uh, the PICO framework. Now, you could say that um, patients with suspend, suspected appendicitis would be your patient group or your population. CRP would be your intervention. It's not really an intervention, but you could assume that. And you could have no CRP or white cell count as your control or comparator, and your outcome could be whether appendicitis um, is the final diagnosis or not. Some other people suggest for these examples that you uh, adopt a slightly different um, strategy um, of using the PICO framework. 
And this strategy is probably well suited for case control studies. So these are studies where you already have the outcome um, and then you stratify patients as to whether they had appendicitis or, or did not have appendicitis. So that would be your population. So population will have two groups. One would have had established uh, appendicitis or the diagnosis would have been secured by some other gold standard test. And another group would be people without appendicitis. The intervention and comparator are uh, uh, similar, are the same as before. In other words, uh, CRP would be your intervention and white cell count would be your comparator. And the outcome here would be a diagnostic test parameter like sensitivity, specificity, predictive values, and so on. Okay, so it's a slightly artificial situation, but this is another way of using the PICO framework. People have suggested an alternative term. You may come across this term, so I've got this um, in the screen. So people call it the PTSD framework, some people. So P is the population, T is the test, which is CRP here, and S is a standard, which is probably the white cell count, and D is a diagnostic test parameter. Okay, so just in case you come across the PTSD framework for diagnostic studies, um, you, you uh, um, have heard it before. Now, there are many other very valid clinical questions, foreground questions, where the PICO format simply does not apply. And I've got some examples on the screen, economic studies, qualitative studies, and mechanistic studies. So, so that's a problem. And the other, there are some other um, issues with uh, PICO, and I'll just run through a few examples. And I'll cite a paper which has explored this in a bit of detail, and you might be interested. So the first thing is sometimes the original question um, can get lost in your attempt to put the question in a PICO format. For example, let's say you've got a patient with a liver abscess and you're thinking, what's the most effective treatment for liver abscess? And in your mind, you're thinking whether antibiotics uh, is, the, uh, is the best way forward or antibiotics with drainage or maybe an operation. So you've got all of these things in your mind. And if you try and uh, um, enforce a PICO model, you might end up in uh, formulating a question wherein you're simply comparing drainage with surgery, for example, or drainage with antibiotics, as opposed to all the possible options. So, um, so in that uh, situation, what happens is once you've um, uh, done your PICO framework and you're doing the searches, you might find it difficult to reconstruct the original question. Right, the second problem, or sorry, another problem, what's happened here? Right, another problem is that um, when you enforce a PICO framework, you often make the assumption that the relationships are causal. What does that mean? Let's consider an example. So let's take uh, the relationship between obesity and say infection after appendicectomy. Now, if you try and consider this as a risk study and use the PICO format, you are making the assumption that obesity um, is probably causally related to postoperative infection. Where, whereas actually it may well be the case that the, um, the person who is morbidly obese may have a higher chance of actually undergoing an open appendicectomy or a lap converted to open appendicectomy than if he or she were not morbidly obese. And it could be that the open approach is associated with a high risk of infection and that obesity per se does not contribute to infection. Yeah, so I hope that, um, uh, this example is clear. So what we're saying here is that you could enforce a PICO format to try and address this question that is looking at the relationship between obesity and infection, but you may um, end up assuming um, that the relationships are causal when they may not be. Right, so what about temporally related questions? So let's say there's a question that says, um, what's the optimum interval for screening in Barrett's esophagus? So in Bar Barrett's esophagus, we do endoscopy to look for esophageal cancer. We do that uh, every so often. It might be annually or biannually or whatever. And if you're interested in the optimum interval, 
and, and that's what you want to find, and you want to go and search the literature or do a study, then you're going to struggle to put this into a PICO format. You might have to make some assumptions. You might say, look, I'm, I probably will look into comparing uh, one-year screening versus biannual screening and, and look at long-term prognosis or something like that. Finally, and that there is a significant problem in applying PICO to background questions. So we talked about background questions and foreground questions before, and here's a classic example of a background question. So what are the ways in which a recurrent pyelonidal sinus can be treated? Uh, surgical, non-surgical, the various, uh, various types of surgery, and that would be a background question, and PICO for, um, frameworks would be difficult to apply. Right, so here is the link if you wanted to um, uh, look at this in a bit more detail. So to summarize, we talk about what PICO is. Um, and I've said that PICO is essentially used to frame a clinical question. And then you can use that framework to develop an appropriate search strategy if you're going to search the literature to get the answer to your question. And also, as we've done uh, today, PICO uh, framework helps to appraise a paper. There are a number of limitations. Essentially, uh, you've got to remember that it's a little bit difficult to apply PICO uh, directly to some situations, especially situations um, around non-treatment questions, and also questions on background and some study designs, observation study designs, and, and particularly case control studies. And I mentioned a few variants of PICO. We've got the PICO-TT, we've got the PECO, that's for observation studies, and we've got the PTSD for diagnostic studies. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone, for tuning in and listening. Until next time, keep running your life with our surgical podcast.